Industry Vice President for Interfax. Today's topic, when CIP spray systems are not recommended or unvaluable, then what? A scientific perspective. We'd like to thank all of our listeners for joining us today. We're recording today's event, and each of you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to view the recording. If you have difficulty hearing our speaker today and are listening through your computer, please check that your speaker volume is up and consider dialing in through the conference call line instead. The dial-in information is on the right side of your screen in the audio portion of your control panel. Feel free to ask questions throughout the event using the questions box located on the right side of your screen in the control panel. We will respond to questions at the end of the presentation. There will be one speaker, 45 minutes of content, with 15 minutes for question and answer. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Jeff Phillips, Director of Science and Marketing, Alconax Inc. Jeff has over 20 years experience in pharmacology, analytical chemistry, critical cleaning, and cleaning validation. He has lectured in over 10 countries and has done many webinars with hundreds of clean questions and issues solved. There's much more to learn and share about critical cleaning in the pharmaceutical industry. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Phillips. Hello. Uh, first, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I'm running off of the slides here because I don't see the slides for, um, for the webinar. Uh, Jeff, we can see your screen. Just put it in full screen mode and you should be fine. All righty. Now that we got that housekeeping out of the way, uh, hopefully everyone is here for this when CIP spray systems are not recommended or unavailable, then what? Scientific perspective talk, as was uh, briefly mentioned uh, <coughs> so well. And if that's what you're here for, then you're in the right place. So uh, stuff was already talked about me, so I hate spotlighting myself, so we're going to jump right into it. So first, uh, I'm with Alconox here. This is a uh, privately held company. It's been around since the 1940s. Pretty much uh, almost anyone who's been in laboratories in the US certainly is probably familiar with that box of Alconox next to the sink. And we're really big in FDA regulated industries. So you know, most appropriately here, pharmaceutical, medical device, <coughs> excuse me, and some others as well. We distribute to something in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 countries and for quite a while. So I'd like to jump right into it and make sure that uh, everyone here understands and knows exactly uh, what critical cleaning is. Now, first, so we, like I said, are all in the same definition. It's cleaning that impacts the value of the finished output from whatever is being cleaned. So one needs to keep in mind that it's critical cleaning if that cleaning is important to your product and your process. Now, what's very typical, obviously, in the pharmaceutical industry as others, is if there's a measurable observation, if there's validation being done, this tends to be key aspects. Other parts is that pretty much if you're FDA or USDA regulated, well, cleaning's going to be pretty critical to you and anyone obviously using your products. The present level, um, this is very important, is normally the minimum level at which no adverse effects take place in a subsequent operation. Now, I can't emphasize this enough because often people you know, ask about this type of definition. And what this is is, again, it's a preset level in pharmaceutical that's pretty well spelt out. And it's the minimum level at which no adverse effects take place in a subsequent operation. And I would also obviously include uh, on the end user as well. Uh, <laughs> um, because obviously, ultimately, that's what we're all here working for and towards. OK, uh, next slide here. In fact, let me see if I get this into more of a screen mode. That may help. So. The detergent, um, certainly in terms of an aqueous detergent, is a synergistic blend of surfactant and ingredients that is made to enhance them. So what does this give you? Well, it gives you a few things. One is, is that it allows you 
to have a total number of chemicals. So you can use less because it is they are having chemicals working together for the removal. And what else? Well, you can have safer formulations. And this is because, obviously, you're using less chemicals. And often, you don't have to have as quite as hazardous of chemicals. You have easier waste disposal. And this is made fairly obvious due to the fact that you are using less aggressive chemistry and not as much. A broader range of residuals may be cleaned, including both water-soluble and an insoluble residues. So a lot of people say, well, it's, it's not very water-soluble. Well, it's precisely detergents, aqueous ones, are designed to take things that are not meant to be dissolved in water and use that universal solvent to help you. And these can be formulated to be clean rinsing, uh, especially in FDA-regulated industries. Things like scents, that's things that smell, not you know common sense. Things like dyes, things like um, rust inhibitors, things uh, like um, you know rinse aids. These type of things should be avoided. Anything that leaves a residue on the surface of your manufacturing equipment should be a concern. So, continuing on, uh, detergents for critical cleaning. Like I mentioned, these are five specific things that you should make sure that your detergents do not have um, that, uh, or have in the case of controlled impurities. But you want to have uh, as little impurities as possible. We already mentioned no fragrances, dyes, residue free as possible, controlled, consistent, unchanging formulation, you know, batch processed. They should have uh, certificates of analysis on every batch, things like that. You should be able to have a agreement made with any um, detergent manufacturer that will notify you if in the event there is any change whatsoever to that formulation in any way, shape, or form. And that should be easy to get. And another thing that one should uh, be able to get, and that is maybe you need to sign a confidentiality type of agreement, but the ability to get a complete disclosure of ingredients more so than you'll find in a standard safety data sheet. So again, we're talking about aqueous cleaning. So what are some of the issues in choosing an aqueous cleaner? Uh, talk a little bit about selections here and effective cleaning. So I'm going to just touch briefly so, again, you can understand kind of what are the things that go into a good, well-built or blended um, ingredients of an aqueous detergent. The three primary ones are surfactants, builders, and additives. So surfactants are surface active agent. Again, not terribly creative, but certainly descriptive does a few different things. Primarily, they emulsify, so that's kind of the, how do you bring oil and water together. They can disperse, so this is like solid particles dispersed in the liquid. They can wet or penetrate, so this improves the surface availability of the residuals. And you can have many types of surfactants, and these can be, you know, uh, things like uh, negatively charged, positively charged, they can be uh, not charged, or you can thank the Germans for this cool word, zwitter ionic, so it can be have both negative and positive charges, and they do a bunch of different types of things. Now, these type of compounds form what's called micelles. I have a cool picture, I think I still kept it in here, uh, that shows a formation of a micelle, so we'll see what that looks like. Surfactants basically lower surface tension of the medium in which it is dissolved. So in other words, you can have um, lowering interfacial tension. And this is between two types of media. It can be between you know, two different types of dirt. It can be between you know, a material of construction and some kind of dirt on it, or the water or other liquid medium, things like that. And as promised, here's my cool picture of a surfactant monomer forming a surfactant micelle. Now, this particular one has hydrophilic heads that are facing towards the water and hydrophobic tails going towards the 
immiscible uh, schmutz or dirt that would be like oil or some other types of thing that doesn't like the water so much. So I kind of like, it's a little bit fuzzy, but I like the picture, so I always keep it. So, <coughs> excuse me, a couple other things. We have builders and additives. Builders can be things like uh, chelating or sequestering types of agents, uh, which will kind of grab like metals and um, take it out of solution or away. Uh, Anti-redeposition, by definition, making sure it doesn't get redeposited. Uh, you can have different types of uh, salts in it. You can have stuff that will provide alkalinity, acidity to it, um, some buffering capacity, things like that. And uh, then you have also additives. And here you can have, uh, now some of these you don't necessarily want to use in an FDA regulated, like, um, like classic corrosion inhibitors. Again, the ones that will leave residues on surfaces. You can also inhibit uh, corrosion and be rinsed away. That type is not as bad. Other, well, commonly used chelating compounds and detergents. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> Things like EDTA, or in case you're stopping the street and someone asks you what that means, it's ethylene diamine tetraacetate. And uh, there's different forms of that, but I'm not going to get into that now. Uh, you can have things like uh, sodium citrate, you can have phosphates. All these kind of things are real good at chelating and getting those nasty little metals out of there. So again, um, the best types of chelating also does sequestering, so it doesn't just grab, but it removes. And um, the, shall we say, offending ions are things like calcium, magnesium, have things like uh, iron or even manganese, and they tend to react with other residues and ingredients and form insoluble precipitates. So, uh, excuse me one second. So you have dispersants. Dispersants can be things like polyphosphates and polymers, and some of the polymers, like I've mentioned here, is like your polyacrylates. And what this does is it improves the ability to remove uh, soluble, uh, non-soluble solid particles. So you don't have to dissolve them, and they can still be removed by water. So here you have multiple anionic sites that neutralize cationic electrostatic sites uh, or residues, and it makes them water dispersible. And again, this uh, helps with uh, removing insoluble stuff. So. Uh, sometimes you can have some solvents in aqueous detergents. Often these are not, um, you know, really that desirable uh, because the whole purpose for aqueous cleaning often is to get away from solvents. But there are some, you know, solvents or, or semi-aqueous solvents that are often used. Uh, glycol ethers is extremely popular in detergency. Um, IPA is often used, um, isopropyl alcohol, and of course the your terpenes, um, most uh, specifically uh, D-limonene. And um, you know the main function here is to solvate, so uh, solvate your grease and oils and such. So here, um, you know you uh, break them down into smaller particles, so this way it's easier for the other parts of the detergent to then. Uh, help remove the dirt so water can wash it away. Oop, I think I went through two slides. Oh, here we go. Rinse aids. So uh, remember I did mention that uh, rinse aids can sometimes be a bit of a no-no, but those are the ones that um, are left on the surface. So the best ones work by wetting and lowering surface tension. And when you have good detergency, uh, you can take advantage of these differences in surface energy, um, and uh, they will in and they will enhance rinsing. So again, you can have chemical reactions that will assist in rinsing, but as long as they themselves are rinsed off, then you don't have to worry in terms of having residuals that could wind up being in um, in product, which is obviously uh, non desirable. Foam control. Uh, these tend to be um, 
you know, additives for high agitation, things like spray balls, your CIP systems. Now, they often have like low cloud points. Uh, normally, they're non-ionic, don't have to be, but typically. And they form a surfactant uh, layer. So what it does is it, 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 it inhibits, oh boy, it inhibits, excuse my language, the uh, foam formation. So here, you basically have um, a residue layer that cannot fold back upon itself. So it's very difficult for foam to form in the first place. And we also had mentioned corrosion inhibitors. Uh, again, here, uh, you want to tend to use things like chemistry and your temperature and drying speed to uh, affect your corrosion. By adding uh, chemical corrosion inhibitors that, that cover the surface, Again, the interest, these tend to be hydrophobic uh, moieties. They do often, and I want to emphasize this, can come off onto your products. So the only types of corrosion inhibition that I typically recommend is controlling the removable chemistry, temperatures, rinsing, drying speeds and temperatures. This, again, I cannot emphasize enough. I don't know how many pieces of equipment I've seen <clears throat> go the way of the dodo or have uh, issues uh, because th this is not followed. All right. Uh, this is a slide I just have liked for a number of years. Uh, you know, it's, it's my own thing. And <coughs> um, not actually something that I did. It was um, by a gentleman named uh, Sammy Awad who um, I always like to give credit for this particular slide. And I like it because it's really nice in terms of showing, you know, oil on a surface. And then you have uh, the removal of this oil. You can see over here where it's being pulled off and forming the emulsion, the uh, surfactant micelle. This is kind of a neat little slide. And you have your surfactant, you know, molecule, your monomer. So I just nice visualization. Okay, and here we have on the left-hand side the uh, primary or our major products that Alkanox manufactures on the um, y-axis and on the upper x-axis. Wow, we have the different mechanisms as well as <coughs> the title of detergent chemistry of Alkanox detergents. That's a little bit redundant, and. What we show here is the various mechanisms, your emulsifying, dispersing, your sequestering, wetting, whether it be alkaline, and acidic, enzymatic, and high or low foamer. And then it just shows the various properties. So this is a neat little table to just kind of keep in mind. Now, I guess as the, uh, what's this, two, four, six, seven words here say, how does one choose an aqueous cleaner? Well, there's certainly lots of suppliers, <clears throat> lots of different quality ranges, and lots of different formulations, and for many, many different reasons. So let's try to delve into this. So <clears throat> the variables can be things like cleaning methods, soil type, substrate type, and, and safety. Um, so again here, <clears throat> you need to choose the detergent for a specific soil, substrate, and method. Let me repeat this. There are three questions that should always, always be answered by anyone you would even remotely consider getting detergent from. What is the soil being removed? What is the substrate? And what is the method of cleaning? If you do not hear these things, I would be very, very suspect. Why? <clears throat> because when you're doing aqueous cleaning or anything with a chemical form of cleaning, it's all about the what? The chemistry. And as such, if you do not have these three things considered, then it can come and bite you. So I can't emphasize that enough. If nothing else is remembered, soil substrate and method. What's that? SSM. I don't know if that means anything. Anyway, uh, next, environment. Minimize disposal concerns or optimize for recycling. Very important. Uh, we live in the environment, and the environment is all around us. Safety. 
we want to consider things that um, will obviously have a safe and appropriate work environment for everyone there. Uh, economy, you want to make sure that you can be able to use things like a, the uh, synergistic combination of ingredients to help minimize the amount you have to use. And then, of course, there's residue potential here <clears throat> where if you have or if you're able to use a lesser amount of chemicals and you also make sure that these chemicals are designed to be free rinsing, then that should give you the least cleaner residue possible. So how about cleaning methods and cleaners uh, required? Well, again, things to think about. Methodology. So is it high or low agitation? In other words, is this, so you have like CIP spray balls like we have in the top of the screen, meaning, um, excuse me, in the bottom of the screen, meaning uh, low agitation? Or is this a manual soaking ultrasonic type of thing like we have in the, in the high agitation? So, um, so for instance, if you have a high agitation where you need a low foam, or, ah, must have got that backwards, but, uh, for your high agitation like CIP where you need a low foamer, and this can be things like spray, spray washers, cabinet washers, dishwashers, things like that, that's where you need a low foaming detergent. Now, uh, where I got it backwards before, where you have immersion, soaking, manual, or ultrasonic, that's where it doesn't matter if there is a higher foamer, but you get to utilize various mechanisms like emulsification, far more than you can with your CIP systems. And it's actually a huge drawback where your CIP systems, uh, you basically rely on things like dispersants and rapid chemical attack. So uh, again, uh, things like ultrasonics, you know, you can use even enzymes, uh, digesting mechanisms and emulsifying. Soil type. So this is a little straightforward. So basically, if you have natural oils, things like that, a higher alkalinity will allow you to do saponification. So uh, those are cleaned with your higher alkaline. Those would be like your, you know, between 12 and 14 type, pH 12 to 14 type cleaners. Then you have your synthetic and petrochemical oils. Here's where emulsifying is extremely important. And keep this in mind. Because remember, high pH, low foaming detergents are you are very very difficult to get extremely good emulsifying. You can always get better emulsifying when you have the ability to use a higher foamer, and you can even go with a more mild alkaline detergent, which is certainly an advantage in terms of safety and environment. So things like salt oxides. Um, you know, metals, things like this. It tends to be best with acid cleaners. If you have to, you know, use a chelating sequestering, mildly alkaline, uh, it may work, but usually you want to steer towards your acidic cleaners. Your particulates, here's where dispersant cleaning is very, very important. These are your non-soluble uh, non particles. And then if you have protein or biofouling, this is where your protease enzyme cleaning is most effective. And usually you want a mild alkaline with really good wetting agents. And if you ever have issues with uh, protonaceous materials, you definitely want to contact us because we have by far the best enzymatic detergent on the market. This is just a nice little table of pretty much the types of things I talked about, you know, with uh, the pHs this time, uh, the type of cleaner and uh, typical soils that are removed. And uh, for our, us pharmaceutical folk, we have uh, looked at in a different way, basically going from red in the bottom, I like that little, that little line on the left-hand side, nice and bright colored, goes from your uh, red low uh, pH all the way up to your high alkaline. So your low pH stuff, uh, uh, detergents that um, are used, are usually used for cleaning off things like your metal oxides or things like, uh, you know, um, carbonates often, you can have things like uh, alkaloids, uh, amphoteric proteins, these can be um, things like free bases, 
such, um, those type of things are clean off better. Now your alkaline detergents aren't good at your, with your fats, your greases, your alcohols, um, organic acids, um, things like uh, diols, triols, those are some of the examples. And your alkaline or acidic, uh, where you kind of go either, it doesn't matter as much. This is where often a lot of your emulsifying detergents come into play especially with things like uh, steroids, uh, pyridines, pyridines, things like that, and certainly your heterocyclics. So again, remember, one of the three things, substrate. So things to keep in, in mind. So when you have aluminum, uh, you want to use either you know, acidic or mildly alkaline. Boy, do I mean mildly. Even not, pH 9.5 is pushing it. Now, you can use alkaline detergents on aluminum if, and please listen to this, if it is properly silicated, meaning that the proper concentration of silicates at use is in solution to protect the aluminum from hydroxy attack. Otherwise, if it's not, alkaline detergent will ruin, destroy, damage, and do bad things to aluminum parts and, and equipment. Mild steel, here's where things like your corrosion control is going to have to be taken into account. You may have to decrease the temperature of your wash, your rinse, and your dry. Those are possibilities. They may increase the time in which it takes to clean, but that may be a trade-off you have to do. Uh, most plastics and resins are fine with cleaners. They're uh, aqueous cleaners. Um, sometimes you want to check some of the solvent content, but in general it's fine. Uh, two plastics I do want to warn people about is when you use um, polycarbonate or acrylic, when they are subject to um, high pressures when they're manufactured and used under high pressure, well, they can undergo crazing or stress cracking when exposed to solvents or surfactants. So keep that in mind when cleaning and feel free to contact anyone at Alkanox for more information. Stainless steel, you're pretty much okay with most of these aqueous detergents. So um, I'm briefly going to mention CIP cleaning, even though that's not the bulk of this talk. CIP cleaning, um, basically it's a high agitation environment. You must be low foaming so as not to interfere with the mechanical action of spray and so it doesn't turn into an episode of the Brady Bunch. Uh, you want short contact time before the next droplet of spray. So that's something to keep in mind, that whatever is being done chemically has to be done very quick because it's going to hit the surface and then run down. That's something to keep in mind. So for instance, you tend to need fairly strong acidic or alkaline cleaner to have fast aggressive cleaning being done. So usually the pHs are below 3, uh, sometimes significantly depending upon the formulation and pH is significantly above 11. Usually they're like 12 and a half, 13 in that range. Special considerations, again, high agitation in, uh, environment. You have that short contact time before the next droplet of spray. Um, you need very good rinse characteristics for fast processing. And this is very important. So that has to be rinsed off lickety split. Uh, it is high temperature compatible. Um, pretty much most aqueous cleaning is high temperature compatible. Uh, use of dispersants to handle bulk solids mechanically. And again, I can't emphasize that clean rinsing for fast processing, how important that is. But as we know with this talk, this is a manual immersion type of talk. And here are the cleaning mechanisms. Here you get to use emulsifying. So this is supported by you know, your chelating and sequestering agents so you don't have the deactivation of um, your anionic surfactants that can happen with um, uh, when you have exposure to things like uh, um, things like calcium and iron and manganese and magnesium ions such as that. Uh, emulsifying works better with longer contact times so not only uh, do you have ones that emulsify better when they're high foamer but with the longer contact times in manual soaking and ultrasonic, uh, you have uh, the overall mechanism working better as well uh, with that longer time. 
So milder chemistries often are employed as well, which are safer for operators, are safer for uh, the environment, and certainly makes your effluent easier. So dispersants that can take time to disperse or flocculate or blow apart soils uh, is also important. So uh, for your higher form, for your higher foaming detergents, um, you know, basically anything that um, is a good emulsion also makes very good soap bubbles, um, kind of like the stuff that you would, you know, stick in those little uh, plastic containers and uh, blow it through those little circles and make the bubbles when you're a kid. Um, these are bilayer structures of stable surfactants uh, creating basically air trapped within a membrane. So it, you know, kind of think of a micelle almost. Uh, these are circular or rod, plate shaped, and um, they can contain hydrophobic oils inside of them. Uh, so this is similar, but not exactly, to a micelle. And um, you know, soap up, soap bubble stability um, from the surfactant that it, that specifically is that uh, emulsifier. So higher foamy detergents also, like I mentioned, contain those uh, chelating and sequestering agents and getting rid of those ions that could uh, de deactivate them. So uh, what are some of the things that can be contained within your higher foaming detergents? Well, uh, the type of rinse aids, and you don't want things like um, cationic amines that can stick to a surface because these can be toxic. And uh, please make sure that um, that you're not using things like quats to clean your pharmaceutical equipment. Uh, enzymes, especially if there's anything proteinaceous, uh, I, I can't emphasize enough uh, to check out our um, enzymatic uh, detergent called um, Tergazine. Uh, dispersants, again, uh, will help with removal of, um, of dirt. Alkalinity builders and buffers to give milder alkaline hydrolysis. So, here are things that should just quickly be avoided in your pharmaceutical uh, equipment cleaning. Some of these I've already mentioned. Things like fragrances, dyes, depositing corrosion inhibitors. I probably said that a, a gazillion times. Uh, the rinse aids, toxic stabilizers. You don't want anything that's going to be uh, needed to stabilize a formulation um, or to uh, act as um, some of the antioxidants, you, know, you have to be careful of as well. And uh, no alkanoxin uh, incorporated detergent contains any of the above. I want to quickly mention the uh, variables of uh, effective cleaning. Uh, so this here is um, basically the way to optimize your process if you consider these nine variables. And that is the acronym that uh, the VP here uh, made up and loves, so I always have to mention in these talks. So BATHOCARD, before cleaning, agitation, time, heat, orientation, chemistry concentration, after cleaning, rinsing, and drying. So before cleaning, and anyone who was, uh, you know, lived on their own as a bachelor for a number of years understands, you know, what happens with plates that are dirty and left for long periods of time, uh, well, they can be very difficult to clean. That's why I uh, many a times just bought new dishes. Uh, Pre-soaking can help remove dried on residues. Uh, you certainly want to keep that dirty hold time as short as possible. Storing parts in a cleaner environment obviously makes them easier to clean. Uh, then second point is agitation. So using higher foaming or sometimes low foaming detergents in your manual soaking and uh, ultrasonic uh, can be advantageous. Uh, you use your low foaming detergents uh, primarily, you know, in your spray washes and uh, the other CIP type of uh, spray ball systems. Uh, for time and cleaning effectiveness, you have digesting mechanisms of uh, time versus cleaning. Uh, now for enzymatic systems, we usually say 20 minutes. There, you can certainly get it considerably less than that. There's numerous variables. I highly recommend uh, speaking with us before doing. Uh, soaking requires time, especially if you have really, you know, dried on stuff can take a long time, and cooler solutions take more time. Speaking of which, heat. Uh, 
basically, uh, we've all been brainwashed with the you know all temperature type things. Uh, detergents will clean in almost any uh, temperature from above freezing to you know uh, to up to boiling. And really, the relationship is is in terms of uh, uh, temperature for approximately now in general as the really equation uh, points out in general for every 10 degrees Celsius warmer your cleaning time is cut in half where the speed is doubled so as that temperature goes up you can have dramatic increases well oh, that's interesting how that happens you can have dramatic increases um, in the speed of your cleaning but always remember that if there are other um, chemical reactions that are occurring and speeding up um, with an increase in temperature that work conversely or make it more difficult to clean, then that can be a complicating factor and one in which um, involving alkanox is certainly appropriate. Above the melting point of things like waxes, greases, or things like uh, paraffins, being above the a temperature of like you know 77 C, I usually say 80 C to kind of round it off, is often more effective in terms of aqueous cleaning. So orientation, I can't emphasize how important orientation is and how often it's it's forgot. In terms of your CIP type systems, that would be like doing your riboflavin studies uh, coverage. But even things like blind holes or dead legs in piping systems or coverage inside a dishwasher, these all need to be um, thought about. <laughs> the chemistry, of course, as we've been talking about before, you know, low foaming versus high foaming, you know, alkaline, neutral, or acidic, uh, you know, uh, chelation capacity to, co to compensate for your hard water. Uh, all these type of issues within the chemistry need to be considered after cleaning, you know, how is it stored, where is it stored, how is it covered, um, you know, is it stored in a place that um, can wind up getting moisture on it. Again, I can't emphasize enough making sure that equipment is stored in a dry area that not only helps in terms of preventing corrosion but also in terms of preventing microbial growth. Rinsing and cleaning effectiveness. So here, uh, rinse water is the last thing to touch the surface. So if that's the case, then anything that is in there, once you have, you know, drying, say through evaporation, will be on the surface. So ways of reducing the potential is by using things like deionized water. Uh, here you can do things like um, you know, you can use uh, ultrafiltration, you can have deionization tanks, you can use distilled water, you can have um, you know, all kinds of things like reverse osmosis. And in terms of your corrosion, uh, a cooler cleaning and rinse will, uh, will reduce the amount of corrosion, but will speed up, um, or I shouldn't say speed up, will actually increase the amount of time it takes to clean because the temperature is going down. Another point to consider is that a rinse and washing temperatures, at least the first rinse, should be the same temperature in order to avoid breaking of emulsion and having dirt and the detergent falling onto the surface and potentially being dried on there. And obviously if you rinse hotter, it's easier for evaporating, but then again, you can also cause corrosion. And also, drying and cleaning effectiveness. This is the D in bathocard. Uh, evaporation deposits your rinse contaminants and may promote corrosion, as I've mentioned. Things like blowing, wiping off rinse water may alleviate these issues. And particulate sensitive drying uh, does require filtered air drying. And again, no no to the humidity or water on the surface. So again, if you understand these nine variables and you match your cleaner to the cleaning method, this can certainly help you 
um, in terms of having an ideal cleaning process. And of course, always uh, not forgetting to evaluate health and environmental and safety issues. So that's your bathtub card. So just a few points to remember. Remember the 10 degrees C rule, you know, double cleaning speed as the temperature goes up. Increase chemistry concentration for increasing bath life and it will give you an increased capacity. Say it again. Increasing chemistry will, in, uh, the concentration will increase your capacity but only have a marginal increase in detergency. Optimize substrate orientation to make sure you have, uh, you know, better rinsing and better cleaning. Uh, increasing agitation or mechanical energy will also help with your cleaning speed. Uh, using correct chemistry, yeah, it's amazing how you use the right thing uh, and it tends to work better. Uh, low foaming cleaners uh, can often uh, rinse uh, faster. Whoop, let's see, that didn't mean to happen, but we got here anyway. And um, now I just want to quickly get into some of the manual cleaning processes, uh, some quick points I wanted to mention here. So in terms of manual for soaking, you can have a very low cost in capital equipment. It could be as simple as soaking within you know, the manufacturing equipment that you have, or if they're small pieces, soaking in just a container, a plastic container or a bucket for goodness sakes. Um, so you have a low cost of capital equipment you know, no one's pushing a washer disinfector and expensive CIP system on you. Uh, it's easy to perform, and uh, you tend not to have fancy, um, you know, computer-regulated systems. So, uh, which means you don't have to do your CSV or your computer system validation. Then you also have uh, ultrasonics. Your ultrasonics is extremely good because. Here you have massive amounts of energy released through cavitations, um, and they're usable on a wide variety of materials, especially when you're above 40, uh, at or above around like 38, 40 uh, kilohertz, because there you don't have as much damage on uh, sensitive, um, sensitive parts. I'll try to hurry this up a little bit. Uh, scrubbing. Obviously, you can have things like wipes and brushes and non-abrasive pads. Make sure that uh, they don't leave any insoluble fibers. Um, you usually want to stay away from abrasives in most circumstances, but not all. Uh, you just want to make sure you don't damage the surface. And usually, uh, most circumstances, sponges are not desirable and certainly not ones that are reused. Manual cleaning mechanisms, you can have your dominant manual cleaning mechanisms. Um, you can have, uh, obviously, things like uh, emulsification, which is better with your uh, manual and, um, and um, you know, things like ultrasonics. Um, this is far better than low foaming. Detergents used in CIP systems and supported extremely well by uh, sequestering agents such as EDTA. You get to use a lot of nice dispersing agents, and um, you have less participating cleaning mechanisms by like lifting and wetting, and so pontification and acid and base hydrolysis tend not to be as important in those mechanisms used, but of course are still, you know, still uh, are still active. Uh, you're able to use uh, high emulsifying detergents. So again, the best uh, in terms of emulsifying detergents are your high foamers. So when you need to emulsify, the high foamers is really the way to go. Visual inspection by operators is easier. You can use mechanical energy from scrubbing. You, you can do, contrary to what others say, you can have uniform and reproducible mechanical ultrasonic energy. And uh, one interesting thing, and this you should pay attention to, lower boundary layers you can uh, deliver through mechanical energy that's closer to the surface, and this allows easier removal of especially uh, some uh, micron particles uh, when you use the uh, appropriate uh, ultrasonic frequencies. And uh, again, the higher the frequencies tend to be better for the smaller particles. Now, uh, here you also get to use milder, easier to dispose of, as well as um, 
uh, safer types of chemistries. Sometimes the only option when equipment is small um, or for tools and small fittings. Now, obviously, there are some disadvantages that I want to mention. It does require label, uh, labor. You have to consider your personal protective e equipment that uh, may need to be applied, any other safety issues. And of course, um, sometimes it can require a higher volume of cleaning chemistry. Uh, just very quickly, in the validation of manual cleaning, it's pretty much all the normal validation components found in any cleaning validation, in your intro scope deviations, um, just running through this list here, testing methods, limits, testing procedure notes, uh, results, acceptance, and summary report. It's all the typical types of things. Uh, cleaning validation, just want to mention, um, requires robust written SOP and training. And uh, I have a reference here uh, for um, inside of our Aqueous Cleaning Handbook that you're welcome to get in PDF format or physical. And uh, the handbook here uh, gives an example of a manual cleaning SOP on page 86. Now just a quick case study and we'll go. This is, um, we had uh, basically some uh, steroids here, some progesterone estrogen as, uh, um, as you can see. And uh, a large-scale pharma manufacturer had trouble meeting their uh, target requirements, and they had to move away from CIP cleaning. So this company was able to meet these requirements and validate using, uh, in this case, it was Alkanox powder precision cleaner. And uh, they got better results came from manual cleaning procedures because they're able to utilize that, that higher emulsifying uh, detergent to um, clean off the progesterone and estrogen. And I thank you all for your time. Great, terrific. That was terrific, Jeff. So as we we have we do have a few questions here. So um, let me just take a look at them for you. Um, here is here is one. What is the best approach to assure that detergent has completely has been completely removed at the end of the cleaning? Ah, excellent, excellent question. Well, obviously from a scientific standpoint, you're not going to have 100% um, uh, in terms that uh, every atom is, uh, is, is removed. You can only detect down to what your equipment allows you. But <clears throat> what, I, what I would do is within my cleaning validations, I would show a very good recovery, and I would show that um, I would also show that uh, my levels are are consistently um, below detectable levels. If you're below detectable levels consistently, then that is good proof that your process is uh, is not only removing um, you know making sure there's no detergent there, but it is removing whatever residuals that may have been left over due to your process. Next question, what test, what test methods are best suited for trace detergent detection in biopharmaceutical manufacturing? Oh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great one. Uh, there's a lot of different methodologies. I would highly recommend calling me um, or emailing me uh, to discuss this in more depth. Um, and uh, especially if it's biofarm, um, uh, more in terms of small molecule, it's been things like HPLC and things like total organic carbon. And you can still actually use some of these in, in uh, large molecule. But um, the gold standard for, the, for years and years and years and years and years has been high performance liquid chromatography or HPLC. But again, I highly recommend uh, contacting me. Uh, as they say, the devil's always in the details. Next question, here's an interesting one. My local sewer authority has a restriction on the amount of phosphorus I could use that I can rinse off. What alternatives can you guys offer? Oh, uh, that's actually uh, not very difficult. Again, I you know urge you to contact me. There are detergents that we have that um, are phosphate-free, and if you need phosphorus-free, 
then we have that as well. And again, I need to know your specific uh, circumstances, what you remember are three things. So in this case, you added also effluent. But um, I still need to know what's being removed, uh, the material of construction, and how the cleaning is being done. But if I can get those three pieces of information from you, uh, we absolutely do have detergents that uh, do not have phosphate or phosphorus. And again, I, I need to have that uh, you know, confirmed specifically. Great. Here's another one. Why do some companies push automated cleaning systems? <laughs> yeah, this is uh, this one I always uh, kind of get a kick out of because um, what was learned a long time ago is that, uh, yes, you can sell detergents, but hey, if I can sell capital equipment, then I can get a sales force that now can get commission off of the sales of these, and I can have salespeople going around making relationships and selling, selling equipment. Um, you know, myself as well as others here <laughs> at Alconox, we're all scientists first. So <clears throat> we think, you know, okay, the problem is getting, removing resi unwanted residuals. How do you do that? If it requires some form of equipment, then it requires some form of equipment. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But that's a very different way of looking at a problem than, you know, all problems can be solved by me selling my, you know, expensive piece of equipment. And unfortunately, I sometimes see that's where the focus is as opposed to, you know, what is the best way to remove this and potentially what is a more cost-effective way in order to uh, accomplish my goals. Here's another. How can you validate the manual, how could you, how can you validate the manual cleaning as there could be multiple cleaners? Each has a oh. strength. Yes, that's another very good question. Uh, again, this is done through lots of um, to having well-written SOPs and training. We have dozens and dozens of pharmaceutical companies that over the years have had manual cleaning that has had consistent results, that has had validated results, that has had FDA inspected and approved results consistently. Uh, again, what this does is, because we have such a reliance upon uh, e uh, not just uh, equipment but computer-controlled equipment, that we forget that when things are done consistently and well and people are trained well, that getting good, consistent results uh, can, be, can be achieved. And we see this, uh, and we have seen this for over half a century. And here's the last question. What temperatures are your detergents effective? Uh, yes, uh, this is one that I, always makes me chuckle because uh, we've all been, uh, as I mentioned before, poisoned by this, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, uh, all temperature or uh, it's almost as bad as the indoor and outdoor allergy uh, um, type of uh, advertisement I see, as if an allergen is going to say, oh, wait a minute, I'm an outdoor allergen. Uh, that's nonsensical, a histamine receptor, and, you know, doesn't know the difference. But, um, you know, uh, again here, it really boils down to um, just uh, a very, uh, I'm sorry, can you please repeat that one question again? What temperatures are your detergents effective? Yeah. So, uh, sorry about that, uh, someone actually distracted me. Uh, what is most important to know is what's the best temperature for your process? So, detergents, as I mentioned before, are workable at all different temperatures, it is going to really base itself upon um, how quickly you want that process to be. So every 10 degrees Celsius warmer, you're going to cut your cleaning time in half. So that's really important to keep in mind. And the minor exception that I mentioned to this was when I talked about some of the um, things like waxes and paraffins. In that example, uh, you have something that is actually changing states. So it's going from a solid to a more liquid state. Obviously, that is a phase change and, and is a difference. Uh, but in general, again, every 10 degrees Celsius that you, um, that you increase the temperature, you are going to cut your cleaning time in half. And 
you should take a look at optimizing your process based upon what your goals and specifications are. Great. Okay, I I think we're we're kind of running out of time here, but um, we want to thank everybody for listening today. If you have any other questions for Jeff, you could contact him directly via phone at 914-948 4040 extension 151 or by email at jphillips at alkinex.com. You could also see Alkinex coming up in five days at Interfex, April 21st to the 23rd in booth number 2254. Also May 6th and 7th in Boston at Biomed Device, June 9th through the 11th in New York at MDNM East and or October 15th and 16th in Puerto Rico at Interfex Life Sciences Innovation Week. On behalf of Jeff and myself, thank you again for listening, and we wish you a great day. Thank you very much.